towards Jewish Vedanta theory and practice. Rabbi Rami Shapiro, a very uh, learned man, very erudite, and has written many beautiful books, uh, which will be uh, uh, kept on for sale, some of them about six titles, and then uh, he will uh, sign them for those who want to buy. Uh, but that will be at four o'clock. Uh, now, uh, I request him without taking much of our time uh, to begin his first lecture. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> let's, let's try that again. <laughs> you sound terrible. No. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, much better, much better. So Swamiji, thank you for many things. Thank you for having me, but thank you mostly for bumping into this and knocking everything over, because I thought I was going to do that. Now if I do it, I, it's a tradition. So I'm just following. I'm just <laughs> that is how the traditions get started. That's how it gets started, yeah. So, so I have until 12.45, so a little over an hour. And then we'll come back and we'll do another hour a little bit later. And the idea is to present uh, a Jewish Vedanta. So let me, let me be very clear about what I have in mind. I'm going to focus on two aspects of Vedanta that I think are, for me personally, tremendously important and fascinating, and then see how Judaism speaks to those. The first one that I'll do today, is the, uh, do this morning, is on the non-dual nature of the divine. So, Advaita, the non-dual, and how Judaism speaks to that. And then the second talk in the afternoon is going to be on the Divine Mother and how Judaism speaks to that. So the first one, the non-dual view of the divine, may not be all that startling, especially if you're Jewish and you've read some of this stuff before. Oh yeah, that's okay. But the Divine Mother stuff is usually shocking to... Um, to Jews as, as well as, as non-Jews. So let me be very clear that what I'm going to present comes from the Jewish tradition but is not the normative Judaism that you're going to find on the streets of, of Providence or anywhere else. All right, if you listen to my, my talk this morning about God and then you go out and talk to someone Jewish and say, oh, I didn't know, but you Jews believe, they're going to go, what? Yeah. <laughs> I never heard that before. At least if you had asked me when I was a kid before I started studying this stuff, I was never taught this growing up in synagogue. I was never taught any of the things I'm going to share with you during my, my five years of seminary. I learned this from rabbis privately and I learned this from uh, secular teachers privately, but this is not mainstream Judaism. But it is all linked to Jewish text and Jewish teaching. So in addition to myself and Swami, we also have, Rabbi, what's, where are you? So how do you like to be addressed? Rabbi, oh. yeah. Oh, Rabbi okay, Rabbi Satlow. So Rabbi Satlow is here. And where's Father? Oh, there you go. So, so fa Father Bishop, Bishop Paul. Bishop Paul. Yeah. So Bishop Paul is here. Do we have any other clergy? <laughs> All right. So we have Judaism represented, Hinduism, uh, Christianity, at least in the Orthodox Celtic tradition, and a lot of other opinions in the room. And I welcome anybody, but certainly the clergy, to jump in and to help elucidate what I'm saying, because I'm going to cross a lot of barriers, boundaries. And if you have a different opinion, it might just sort of enrich the conversation to hear, to hear that. So I, I have no problem with people disagreeing with me. If you do, that's fine. You've probably been wrong before. <laughs> and I can, I can live with that. But I also am happy with this or comfortable with that because I don't believe that what I'm telling you is the truth. I don't think we can convey the truth, right? Uh, where it says, you know, truth is one, uh, People, different people call it by different names from the Rig Veda. I, I think that's true, but I don't think any of the names by which we call it are it. 
I think we have to juxtapose or maybe even blend the Rig Veda text, truth is one, different people call it by different names, with the opening line of the Tao Te Ching in Chinese, mm -hmm. where Lao Tzu writes, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. So it's not that every word that we use to talk about truth is accurate or true, it's that none of them are true. If you can reduce truth to a concept, it isn't what I'm talking about. But when we talk, we use words, we use language, we use concepts. So I want you to listen beyond what I'm saying, but in a very careful way, so that you don't simply hear the echo of your own mind, right? Because that's what I'm going to hear is the echo of my own mind. I've heard it, you know, and I get, oh, that's true, that's true, that's true. That's because I'm saying it. So of course I think it's true. I don't want to stand up here and tell you something I don't believe in. I just want to be clear with me and with you that just because I believe it doesn't make it true. And that ultimately truth with a capital T is something that we cannot label, we cannot put into a system. So last point on this, last night uh, at dinner, we were talking and someone said, well you, they thought I had said that only one religion can be true. And it was from a lecture I gave. And what I do believe is that if you look at the standard theologies of the major religions, they are fundamentally different. You know, either God has a son or God doesn't. You know, either Jesus was born of a virgin or he wasn't. Either uh, the Quran is the one true final revelation of God or it isn't. And if it is, then the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible are lesser revelations and the Baha'is are out altogether. So if you take that mainstream approach, the religions are always in conflict. I'm not taking that approach. I would say, I think in accord with the Rig Veda and, even, and, and certainly with, with Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching, that all of these are attempts to articulate what's fundamentally inarticulatable, ineffable. And so we get facets of the truth, but never the, the whole thing. So it's not that I believe one religion is true, I believe no religion is true. They're all pointing towards something, like in Zen we say the finger pointing toward the moon, they're always pointing towards something, but we humans get focused on the finger, which we give to one another all the time as we try to explain you know, what re our, our true religion is. But it's the moon that we're, really, that we're really trying to get at, and you can't get at it with words. So you do get at it through silence, through, through meditation, I think, uh, or at least you get closer to it. And the last thing, just on what I just said, everything I said is wrong if you imagine that there's an it to get to. Because right? there's no truth. Truth isn't out there or in here. It's just this. So there's no journey, even though I'm going to talk in a moment about journey. There's, th these are all metaphors. There's, there's no journey. It's not like if I meditate for 20 years, I'm going to get it. You've got it now. It may take you 20 years to realize it, but it's not that you're going to get something then that you don't already have now. So it's more of an awakening, a realization, than uh, being gifted with or, or grabbing something that you, that you lack. Okay, so let's, let's talk about God a little bit from this strand of Judaism that I want to share, this Advaita strand. And let me start by giving you what I consider to be the mission statement of Judaism. And it's from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 1. 1, 2, and 3. So I know you all know it by heart. <laughs> So I could put you on the spot and you should, no, I'm just kidding. So in that passage, that's where Abraham and Sarah are called by God. It's called Lech Lecha in Hebrew, L-E-C-H-L-E-C-H-A. And in 99% of our uh, English translations of the Hebrew Bible, it'll say, go forth. God says to Abraham and Sarah, go forth. And I'll read to you from standard New English Bible. Uh, said to Abraham, go forth from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. It's not a bad translation. It's just a flat translation. All translations, and I translate a lot of biblical text, all translations have a political bent. They have a built-in bias of the translator 
her or himself. Uh, no translation is going to give you the fully nuanced, under, give you a fully nuanced understanding of the original. I mean, you just can't do it. You can't do it from English to another language. You can't do it from Sanskrit into English. You can't do it from Hebrew into English because the languages in and of themselves are so rich and you have to then find a word that you're going to translate that richness into. And again, it's, it's very, very difficult. I would even argue almost impossible to get that richness of the original. So what we miss when we read lech lecha as go forth is the deeper meaning of the two words lech and lecha. Lech means to walk, so go. And in the story, they go on an outer journey. But lecha can also mean, not simply you go, it means go toward yourself. The cha at the end is you, and the le is a, can be read as a direction. So it's lech, journey, to yourself. Now, Hebrew doesn't have capital letters or lowercase letters, but if I were translating this into English, I would say journey to your capital S self, to the Atman is what they're talking about. Journey toward that true self. Now, it's not yourself. You don't own it. And I would even argue there's only one of it. And we are each a part of it. So when you discover yourself, that's the way we talk about it, you're discovering myself. You're discovering the self, the Atman that is Brahman. And I think that's what we're talking about here. So lech lecha from your country and your kin and your parents' house, journey out of these things, leave these behind. It's both an external journey, which is what they take in the story, but it's also this internal process. So what is the process? The process is freeing yourself, walking away from the conditioning of your country and your kin and your parents' house. In the rabbinic commentaries, the rabbis say, look, if this were an outer journey, if they were just leaving home and then leaving their clan and leaving their country and going to another place, the order in the Bible is all wrong. It should say, Lech lecha, get out of your parents' house. Because when you leave home, that's what you leave first. And then you'll get out of your neighborhood, your kin, your clan. And then eventually you'll find the borders of your country and you'll get out of your country. But the Bible has it backwards. And so the rabbis say the reason it's backwards is because it's not about that journey out of your parents' house and your neighborhood and your country. It's about a journey out of your conditioning from the most from the easiest to get free from to the most difficult. And they argue that it's the easiest one is nationalism. You can change countries. The hardest one is the bias, biases and the conditioning and the, the way your parents have shaped your mind. That's the hardest one to get out of, and that's why it's last. So if I were writing this over, if you know, God had chosen me instead of Moses to write the five books, I would have said, you know, journey inwardly as well as outwardly, or make your outward journey an inward journey as well. I don't know how you'd put that. And free yourself from the conditioning, not only of country, kin, and parents, but from your country, from your ethnicity, from your race, from your gender, from your religion, as well as your parents, from all the things that shape your mind in a certain way. And then it says, after you get out of all those things, it says, you're going to go to a land I will show you. But the implication is they won't know they're in this land until they get there. It's not like God gives them a map. God just says, get out of town or free yourself from all this conditioning. And then I'll show you this place. In my understanding of this, it's, yes, there's a geographical place. I mean, the Bible can be read as a, you know, a political document about the Jews you know, inhabiting the Promised Land. But as a spiritual document, what we're talking about is not a state of, it's not a geographical place. It's not a political state, though it is those also. It's a state of mind. And the state of mind is what's left after we clear away all of that conditioning. Again, it's not getting something you lack, 
It's realizing what you have, but it's covered in layers of, um, you know, vidya, of, of ignorance. So you want to take away the ignorance, the conditioning, and then you can see clearly, because now the lens will be clear. You can see clearly, and what you'll see is what God is showing you right now, except our, our lenses are, are occluded, you know, clouded over. You'll see what you couldn't see before, <clears throat> and that is, from, from my understanding, that is the divine manifest in, with, and as everything. We can only see that when the conditioning is gone. Now, I don't know about you. My own experience is the conditioning is gone. If ever, it's only gone like that. And then I come right back in. You know, I hear, I hear my father's voice immediately saying, what are you talking about? And then I, I hear, oh, and you're a Jew, and you're an American, and you're this, and you're a liberal, and all that kind of stuff. So all the conditioning comes back in, so I have to continue the practice. It's not a once and for all journey. It's a continual uh, cleansing away of, of these conditioned voices or, or these conditioned uh, layers of, of distortion that, that block my vision from being true. But when it is, or in, in the Bible with Abraham and Sarah, when they get to that place, when they free themselves from all that conditioning, they arrive at this place. Now, what happens at this place? The Bible goes on. It says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. So you could read this from a very jingoistic way, perspective. You could say, ah, this is about power. So the Jews, they're not called that yet, but they're, you know, the, the people of Abraham are going to go into this land, and then they're going to get stronger and stronger and more and more and more numerous, and they're going to become a mighty people. And those who support them, God will bless them. And those who attack them, God is going to destroy them because God only cares about the Jews. And you know, that's, that's a, ra a way to read it. And some people do read it that way. That's not the way I read it. It's not the way I was taught it. It is the way I was taught it when I was a kid, but not the way I was taught it when I, when I started studying more deeply. The way I was taught it is to read it is like this. You free yourself from this conditioning. You see the world as it really is, as a manifestation of the divine. Now, this afternoon we'll talk about it's a manifestation of the divine mother. But we'll get to that. So then you become strong. Not strong in numbers. Strong in character. Strong in your being. You become rooted in that mindset, in that place. And that's the blessing. The blessing is the realization itself. And then you will be a blessing. Now it shifts. If it's just about what do I get, what do I get, it's, it's useless. It's very narcissistic, very egotistical. You get the realization of all of this being divine. You become strong in that realization in order to be a blessing. And then it says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. It's not that God is saying, OK, I see. You don't agree with, with uh, Rami, so you're going to get you know, zapped. No, I don't think that's what it means. It means when you align yourself with the realization, even if you don't have it fully. When I, when I was listening this morning to the, the meditation that Swamiji gave, I, I understood on different levels what you were saying. And then there was a place that I couldn't get to. You know, I, I wasn't manifesting it. I was aware of it. I was thinking about it. I was something like that. But I, I wasn't in that place. I was close, maybe, but, but not there. So to the extent I align myself with that idea, I still get the blessing of moving closer and closer to it. The extent to which I say, ah, Swamiji doesn't know what he's talking about. Everything is different. Everything is at war. Everything is, there's no unity. It's just diversity. And we're all fighting over you know, whatever we want to fight over. The extent to which I resist aligning myself with the truth that's revealed in this text, it's revealed in, in, in many traditions, the extent to which I resist aligning myself with that is the extent to which I'm cursed. Not by a conscious God who says, oh, you don't believe? When are you going to get it? I'm cursed because I'm now swimming against the current. 
the ocean is infinite. It contains, in some parts, you know, hurricanes, and in some parts, it's calm, and in some parts, it's stormy, and in some parts, it's, you know, very choppy, and in some parts, it's just very smooth. It holds all of these different states at the same time. So it isn't one or the other. You can be in a storm and still be in the ocean. But when we work with the current, you know, just, just the other day, I saw someone said that it was an actress, and she was caught in the riptide. Anyone see this on the news? I don't even know who she was. But she was caught in the riptide and someone saved her. But I was always taught, living in, in Miami, I lived there for 20 years, if you find yourself in, the, in that situation, you surrender to the water, you don't fight it, you'll become exhausted, you'll drown. You surrender to it and you swim parallel to the shore, not trying to get back to the shore. You swim parallel and eventually it just lets you out, it just spits you out. And then you can get out of the ocean. It's that surrendering that really matters. So, but you can do that or not. You can align yourself with the current of the divine, which leads you toward holiness, we'll get to in a second, by surrendering to it and letting it take you where it wants you to go, which is this place of, of awakening. Or you can fight against it. And if you fight against it, that's the curse. And that's up to you. But the curse is you will not get where the ocean wants you to be, and you will not get where you want to go either, you'll simply become exhausted and drown. And then if you believe in reincarnation, you're lucky enough to say, well, I'll come back and try again. But maybe you'll come back as a rhinoceros and it'll be a long time before you come back as a human, so don't know. So then he says, um, and you will be a blessing for all the families of the earth. I and mean, this is a very radical statement. The mission of Judaism, but then I would say the spiritual mission of all people, is to free yourself from conditioning, find yourself in that state of awakened realization where you realize that the divine is manifest in, with, and as all things. Work with that current of that awareness, that awakening, leads you to become a blessing to all the families of the earth, not just your fellow Jews, it doesn't say that, not even your fellow humans, but all beings, sanctioned and non-sanctioned, animate and inanimate, you become a blessing. Now, what that means cannot be defined in advance in a text. It's only what it means in your specific situation at this moment. So, all right, so I'll give you a concrete example. I'm looking over at my shoes, and I, I see Swami's shoes are right next to mine. And, and we're both wearing those little rubber clogs, and you got those, the, the, the part that goes behind your, your heel to hold them on. So neither one of us was using those. So his shoe is nice, and, the, and the, the back part is laying nicely on the front, which is honoring the shoe. Mine is sticking straight up. It's neither in the back, it's neither in the front. I just kicked it off and wasn't paying attention. I'm not being a blessing to my little rubber clogs. All right, so, I mean, you go, well, who cares about clogs? No, you have to care about clogs. It's all the families of the earth, the rubber families as well as the, the human families. There's nothing... No situation in which you can find yourself that you aren't called to be a blessing. And the blessing means to attend to it and to engage it in a way that in Judaism we would call, or Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, would call an I-thou relationship, recognizing that other being, animate, inanimate, sentient, or not sentient, recognizing that other being as a manifestation of the divine and treating it with that kind of respect, putting my shoes where they belong, you know, putting, putting away the dishes, putting away whatever it is I'm, I'm doing. And of course, treating people. We have a practice in Judaism on Friday nights, <clears throat> well, in general, but when you're, you say the blessing over the bread, and you say the blessing over the wine, and the, the bread, wine always comes first, and, and then the bread. And you cover the bread. And I was taught, you know, why do you cover the bread? And I was taught, so the bread would not know that the wine was always blessed first. So it's, it's, its feelings wouldn't be hurt. Now, I wasn't taught that as a little kid, because that sounds like a silly thing you tell little kids. I was taught that as an adult by another adult. And of course, I thought it was absurd. I don't believe my bread has eyes. But if it had ears, it would hear even that it was always second. So maybe it doesn't have ears either. But I said, what does this really mean? And the rabbi said to me, look, you have to care about a loaf of bread 
and the feelings of a loaf of bread and treat the bread with respect as a stepping stone to caring about the earth that gives you the bread and the, and the farmers that, that plant the wheat and harvest it and all the people who are involved in getting that bread to you. You have to start with wherever you are. And if we're with bread at the moment, you try to treat the bread with respect. You, you follow what I'm saying? So there's, there's no instant in your life where you're not called upon to be a blessing. The closer you are in, or the, the, maybe the deeper you go in the process of lech lecha, freeing yourself from conditioning, and in this case, the conditioning would be, would be the conditioning that says, oh, it's just a piece of bread. But the more you free yourself from that and realize that, no, it's God manifesting as bread, then you naturally treat the bread with respect. But I'm not always there. So Judaism is a whole system of you know, some people say rules, but I don't, I don't see it that way. Judaism is a whole system of guidelines to help me treat whatever I'm experiencing with respect so that I can be a blessing to whomever and whatever it is I'm, I'm engaged with. So I, I need to make that clear. Is that, everybody got that idea? Okay. So let's go, go to this God notion. So we have the mission. God is sending us, so it's the, the divine current is pushing us in this, in this direction. So let's talk a little bit about little theology and then some practice. So I was raised with the notion that God is basically an old white man with a beard. And all the language I was given with regard to God was male language. And a lot of times God was angry and he was sort of like my dad, <laughs> except my dad's hair is red and he has no beard. So my dad has no beard because Orthodox Jews, traditionally not, they don't cut their, their beards, but uh, in modern Orthodoxy, I don't mean like today's Orthodoxy, this goes back decades, but when they invented electric razors, they decided that the razor, the blades never cut, your, never touch your skin. Therefore, if you're Orthodox, you, you can use an electric razor. You just can't use a straight razor. So my dad bought an electric razor and there went his beard. So he, he looked more American, I guess. I don't know. I was rebellious. I grew a beard. So I grew up with the idea that, you know, God was a male and, you know, basically white. And he lived up there somewhere. And he was always watching, and he was always judging. So, you know, at, at um, the Jewish High Holidays, we have this, uh, this story that we, this metaphor that we use, that God has these two books, the Book of Life and the Book of Death, and God's going to put your name in one or the other. And then you have to, you have 10 days, basically, to get yourself into the Book of Life. And there's different ways you can do it. You can bribe God, you can plead with God, you can do all kinds of things. I, I, I found the entire idea silly. I think there's an, there is a notion with a metaphor that the books work, but it's about you putting yourself in the book of life or the book of death. Are you living in a way that's, that promotes life, or are you living in a way that promotes death, either physical death or emotional death or you know, whatever, however you might understand it? So there's a way to salvage those stories. But the God that backed them up, I could never salvage. Now I'm a little more comfortable, not personally, not for myself. I never really refer to God as the father figure. But uh, I, I'm more comfortable with other people doing so. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't send me off the deep end like it used to. But it isn't my theology at all. And again, we're talking about the Advaita, the non-dual approach to God. Growing up Jewish, I never heard of such a thing. I mean, first of all, the term Advaita is not Hebrew, so for sure I never would have heard a Sanskrit term. But I never heard any idea even remotely close to what I know Advaita to be. And yet the tradition is rich with this. So I'm just going to read you a few texts just from the last few hundred years and then go into something deeper from the Bible itself. <clears throat> so... They're in no particular order. I'm taking these from, from my book called Minyan, 10 Principles for Living a Life of Integrity, written by someone who doesn't, but <laughs> feels guilty about it. 
So let me just start with this, I guess the way they show up in the, in the book. This is by a rabbi Moshe Cordovero from the 1600s, 16th century, 1500s. And he says the following, God is found in all things, and all things are found in God. And there is nothing devoid of divinity. Everything is in God, and God is in everything, and beyond everything, and there is nothing beside God. So there's a progression in his paragraph here. <coughs> God is found in all things is where he starts. Now, it's not where he ends up. It's just where he starts. A lot of people will say this. A lot of New Age thinkers will say, oh, God is inside of me. Well, if that's true, God is too small. If you think God is inside of you only, then that's not the infinite God. If you're going to make a distinction between inside and outside, you're not in a non-dual state. You're simply working inside and outside. So he starts with that, though. He says, God is found in all things, and all things are found in God. Now, now he's broadening it. So it's not simply that there's a divine spark in you. You also rest in the infinite ocean of the divine. Then he says, and there's nothing devoid of divinity. And he actually has an exclamation point. There's nothing devoid of divinity, heaven forbid. So whether it's good or it's bad, it's God. Whether you like it or you don't like it, it's God. There's a, let's see if I can find it. I wasn't going to read this text, but it just popped into my mind. And it's a good thing I wasn't going to read it, because now I can't. Oh, here it is. Um, this is a, a poem by someone. So, so Cordovero wrote in the 1500s. Uh, 200 years later, another rabbi, um, Levi Yitzchak, Yitzchak, wrote this. It's a poem. He called it Doodla. Doodla is like um, when Jesus calls God Abba as opposed to Av. Av is father. Abba is dad. So doodla is like, it's Yiddish, but it's, it's in the same in German. Do is a formal thou, but doodla is you, sweetie, you know, like this <laughs> kind of thing. One of, my, <clears throat> one of my teachers, she's passed away now, but uh, one of my teachers with regard to the Divine Mother uh, is Sister Jose Habde. She's a Catholic nun and a Native American medicine woman, and she's like this tall. And, oh, no, I'm standing on a little thing. She's this tall, <laughs> all right? And she was invited to visit the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama's attendants met with her first. And, and she's older than he is. And he was already elderly when this was happening. And they said to her, look, you go, and we're going to give you the white scarf. And then you hand it to the La Dalai Lama, and then he hands it back to you. You make no contact with his holiness whatsoever. She said, fine. So Dalai Lama is, is tall. And she comes over to him, and she has the white scarf, and she hands it to him. <coughs> and as soon as her hands are free, she reaches up and grabs his face, his cheeks. And he goes, oh! <laughs> and she's pinching him. And she says, you're my baby brother. That's doodling. That's, oh, you're so cute. That's that kind of intimate, intimate thing. So that's what Levi Yitzchak is calling God, you, sweetie, like that. And he says, this is the poem. Where can I find you? And where can I not find you? Above, it's only you. Below, only you. To the east, it's only you. To the west, only you. To the south, only you. To the north, only you. If it's good, it's you. If it's not good, it's also you. It's you. It's only you. So this is radical non-dual theology. There's nothing that isn't the divine. We want to make God good. And as soon as we limit God to goodness, then we've got to figure out what to do with evil. So in some Hindu philosophies, we simply deny that evil exists. Now, you don't understand it. It's not really evil. In some Judeo-Christian philosophies, Islam also, I think, sometimes you find people saying, well, it's, it's, it's really good. You just don't know because God knows what's best for you. And it'll turn out all right in the end. That's not what non-dualism is about. Non-dualism does not deny the good and the bad. It simply says they're both manifestations of a singular reality. And you can't do without them. 
I mean, that's what non-dualism is. I'm, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, so I hope you don't mind. But when, when, when I teach this, when I'm talking to you, it's easy for me to do this, because I'm using language you understand, and not simply because you have you know, Advaita backgrounds, maybe, but because you're adults. So I can say stuff to you, and I'll nod that it's true, and you'll nod that it's true, and we think we've said something. But it's better to teach little kids, because they're not smart enough to be dumb. <laughs> they go, what? You know, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. So I used to teach this to kids. When I, when I had a synagogue for 20 years, I, this is what I taught the, the children. So one of the ways I taught it is I would bring them magnets, bar magnets. And when we would talk about, you know, we play with the magnets and you can feel the magnetic force, you can feel the attraction if it's the opposites, and you can feel the repulsion if you got the two positives together, the two negatives together, and you can stack them. I would bring in magnets that uh, were donut shaped and you could stack them on a pole and they wouldn't touch and they would just vibrate so you could see what you could, you could feel a little bit and get a sense of what you normally can't see, magnetic force. But I would give them bar magnets and we would talk about positive and negative once we had a sense. And I said, you know, negative is a negative sounding word. It's negative. Eh, I don't want negativity in my life. I don't want the bad in my life. Let's cut it out. So we would get scissors, because the magnets were thin, and we would cut off the negative side, negative pole. So what happens when you do that? It's, you, <laughs> the negative just comes back, right? So, th so we would discover that right away. And I said, well, we didn't cut enough. So we cut more. And then it comes back, and we cut more, and it comes back. You can't get rid of the negative pole or the positive pole. You can't have a magnet that's just positive or just negative. That's not what a magnet is. A magnet is the positive and negative. You can't remove the poles and still have a magnet. It's not other than the opposites. It's just bigger than the opposites. You follow that? You can't have a magnet that's, you can't say, okay, here's a, here's a positive pole, negative pole, let me pull the magnet out of it so you can see it for what it is all by itself. It doesn't work that way. It's the thing itself, and it includes positive and negative. God is the same. Another uh, way I like to do this with them is, you know that, that um, oh, what's it called? When you see the figure ground tests, you see like a vase, but then you look at it one way, it looks like a vase, and then you look at it a little bit different, it's two faces staring at each other. So when you see the faces, the faces are called figure, and the vase is the ground, and you see the vase, the vase comes to the, fore, the foreground, so it's called, ground, uh, called figure, and the faces are in the background, they call that ground. And you can go back and forth just by shifting your attention. So we would do that, and then I would say, okay, turn it upside down so you can't see it. Now what is it? When you're not looking at it, what is it? You create figure and ground. But when you're not looking, what is it? It can't be just figure, and it can't be just ground. Is it just figure ground? Maybe that's the best way we can put it. Is a magnet just positive dash negative? Maybe there's no other way to say it. I don't, I don't know. But when we're talking about God in the non-dual way, we, we cannot separate out anything. So if it's good, it's you. If it's not, if it's bad, also you. So we don't want to get in the trap of thinking that God is one thing or another. God is one thing and the other. So this is Shnur Zalman of Liadi, the founder of Chabad Chassidism. There must be a Chabad place here, and yeah. if not 12. Um, so he writes in the 1700s also. He says, everything, so remember, um, Cordovero said everything is in God. He says everything is God who makes everything exist. And in truth, the world of seemingly separate, uh, and in truth, the world of seemingly separate entities is entirely empty. Nothing is separate. It's all just the divine. I was watching the other day on, on one of the science channels. I love TV, and I only watch science now. <laughs> I was looking for a probably law and order, but I stumbled on the science <laughs> channel. And they were talking about dark matter, dark energy. They're trying to figure out why the universe doesn't keep you know, expanding so quickly that everything just goes cold. 
And the answer is some, there has to be something with more gravitational pull. And they are, so they're positing dark matter, matter that you and I can't see. Light goes right through it. That, but it has mass, and it's holding the universe together, even though it's expanding, but it's expanding slow enough that it'll take billions of years before we all die a cold, dark death. So it, it's, there's something there. And then there's dark energy, also we can't see, that's even more prevalent, that's pushing it apart. So the idea is what we look at, and we see all these distinct things, it's what Albert Einstein called an optical delusion. The reality is there's just one thing with all of these facets. And the one thing is what we're calling God here. So uh, Schneerson starts out saying you know, that everything is God. God is everything. Then he goes, his um, son-in-law writes in the 1900s. Not his son-in-law, his um, Oh, I don't, I don't even know what the relationship would be, but a couple hundred years later. Uh, the absolute reality of God, this is another Hasidic Rebbe, Hasidic master. The absolute reality of God, while extending beyond the conceptual boundaries, borders of existence, so it's, it, it goes beyond anything you and I can, can think of, even when we say God is, you can't even say that, it's bigger than is, also fills the ex entire expanse of existence as we know it. So whatever God is, God surpasses everything, but includes it in, it in itself. There's no space possible for any other existences or realities we may identify. The objects in our physical universe, the metaphysical truths we contemplate, our very selves do not exist in their own reality. They only exist as an extension of divine energy. I mean, that's non-duality. That means you're sitting on God. You're sitting next to God. That's the realization that comes when we strip away all the conditioning that says that can't be right. Your God sitting on God next to God. When the conditioning is removed that keeps you from realizing that, and you're entering that place that only godliness, that, that only God can show you, that only that, where that awakening can happen, then how do you treat the chair you're sitting on, the person you happen to be at the moment, and the people around you? You treat them with absolute respect because you recognize them all as the divine. It's not a metaphor. It's reality itself. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 25, just so the Celts don't feel left out. Fun. Right? When Jesus says, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. Now, it's not just that Jesus is identifying with the least of these. It's that Jesus is that poor person on the ground. Jesus is the person in the prison that you go to visit. Jesus is the hungry person you fed. When Mother Teresa says she sees Christ and all of the people she's helping in India, it's not a metaphor. Well, I'm hoping. It's not, not, maybe, I don't know. I, I read her, her diary. Maybe it is a metaphor. But I don't think it's a metaphor. She's actually seeing Christ in, with, and as everything. It's just another way of seeing God in, with, and as everything. The only difference in, in the non-dual philosophy and standard understanding of, of this in Christianity is that Christianity makes the Jesus incarnation of God unique. So when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, everyone's assuming it's Jesus alone and the Father are one. Whereas if he had said it, instead of saying it in Jerusalem, if he had said it in Delhi, everyone would have gone, oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Right? They would have gone, nice going Jewish person. <laughs> because everyone gets it. But in Jerusalem, they're going, what? So unfortunately, in the West, we've kept that sense of, of uniqueness. What Jesus is telling us is the realization that is our realization when we, as Paul says, put on the mind of Christ and have the same experience that Jesus has and knowing that you know, he is the vine and we are the branches and uh, God is in Jesus and, and we're uh, God, Jesus and God and we're in Jesus. It's all this sim singular system of divine manifestation. Okay. You following me so far? All right. So let me go back to the Bible and get to the exercise. I'm really tempted to just knock this over just so <laughs> to keep the tradition. Yeah, keep the tradition alive, but. I'm reformed and I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoop, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
you see, you cannot, you can't fool. You were not eating, uh, reformed enough. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> no, the divine mother. She just said, oh, you, don't. you have to do it. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah. I'm just going to put this down. Yeah. What is this? Is this how you clean it? These little 3M things? Oh, that's a sticky. Oh, these are stickies, in case I was going to. Oh, I see. Now, how are we going to wash this thing? Oh, you had something here. Okay, so we'll figure that out. Do you hear me if I walk away from that mic? Yes. So let me just give you the name, <clears throat> one of the names of God that is in the, the Bible, how it works, and how it looks in, in Hebrew. Now, we're not supposed to write the name of God, and you're certainly not supposed to erase it. <laughs> so, so the karma is all mine. But okay. So this is what it looks like in, if you can see it. This is what it looks like in Hebrew, and Hebrew goes this direction. So there's, there's four letters here. There's a letter Yud, and this is the letter He, and this is a third letter Vav, and this is the letter He. So there's four, there's four letters, and it's in our English Bibles, it's what we translate as Lord. And if you're looking at a very Christian Bible as opposed to more academic oriented Bible like the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, you'll see it Lord with capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So you're, you're I remember, I don't know if you were trained this way, but we were trying to say Lord, right? You can't just say, and the Lord said, you have to go, and the Lord said. So you really get to this capital letter, right? And where I live in Tennessee, they do that all the time. Well, the Lord is on our So this is the word that we translate sadly as, as Lord. And the reason I say sadly is because Lord is everything I know know to be false about Finding a good metaphor for God. Now, if God is everything, then God is this also. I get that. But I don't want to deal with it. Because it bothers me so much. I still have my condition. Lord is masculine. Lord is hierarchical. Right? Lord is on top. We're down here. Right? Uh, it, it, it smacks of, of militarism and all this stuff that, that I don't like. All kinds of stuff that made sense, you know, maybe thousands of years ago in people's mindset. But I don't like it. Thankfully, that's not what the Hebrew says. Because you cannot pronounce the name of God, not simply there's a rule against it, it's actually unpronounceable. It's just four consonants that um, Rabbi Art Waskow, he's not the only one, Art Green also. Art Green is not too far from here. Where is he? Boston? He's in New York. Oh, he's moved to New York? So they, they say if you try to pronounce Y-H-W-H or Y-H-V-H, you get the sound of wind, so spirit maybe. And I don't know if that's what the biblical authors had in mind or not. But you cannot really pronounce it in any coherent way. So every time you come to this part of the Bible, what are you going to do with it? So the rabbis came up with a, a way around it. They said, we'll have a euphemism. And the euphemism they used is Adonai, which means Lord. And luckily for them, Lord is, is male and hierarchical. And the rabbinical system was male and hierarchical, thankfully. No longer exclusively male, still hierarchical. But, um, so it's not that the people who are translating this don't know better. It's just the tradition. But if you go back to the Hebrew itself, it's so much more powerful. What you have is the future in perfect form. Am I right? You go to the Bible. Of the Hebrew verb to be. You can't really translate it, but it's sort of like ising. God is the ising of the universe. In Exodus uh, chapter 3, when Moses meets God at the burning bush, uh, Moses says, What should I tell the people? What's your name? And God says, Ehiyah Asher Ehiyah, which again, the English Bible is normally translated as. I am that I am, as if God were static. Now, I know that we say, in, in Vedanta, we say God is unchanging, but I want to challenge that. Is that already change and unchanged? That's a duality. But in the Hebrew, ehiyah, asher ehiyah, badly translated in the static, I am that I am, much better that I am becoming what I am becoming. I'm, I'm the ongoing happy happening 
of the universe and the source from which it manifests. And there's no good English for this. The Divine Mother is the manifest divine. The, this is the unmanifest divine. So, all right, let's see if this makes sense. We've got to get to the exercise. So, this is how it's written. Okay. If I die in the next 30 seconds, <laughs> you'll know that you're in the wrong religion. <laughs> okay, nothing happened. Yet. <laughs> yeah, don't sit too close to me at lunch. <laughs> the Jewish mystics play with the language all the time. One of the things I love about Judaism, and it may be, I don't know if it's unique to Judaism, but it's probably a unique and I mean this in a positive way, obsession of Jews, to play with language. We recognize that you cannot reduce God to a, to a system, a linguistic system especially, and yet you and I talk with words. So in the mystical traditions of Judaism, you can explode the language in so many different ways. And, and we don't have time to go into them, but there's 32 different ways to turn the language inside out in order to keep you from being stuck on a single reading. But one of the things they discover is if you take the Hebrew name for God, which you normally write from right to left, and you write it vertically, you get this. First letter is Yud, second letter is He, third letter is Avav, <coughs> and then the fourth letter again is that letter He. Can you see it? Yeah. It's good that it's small. I can hold it up. So what does it look like? Yeah, it's a person, right? So when it says in Genesis 1, 26, 27, that you and I are created in the image of God, the mystics, the Kabbalists said, it's written right in the text. If you know how to read it, you got to turn it on its head. But if you know how to play with it, you are the name of God. Your actual physical form is the name of God. And it's already that. It's not that you're going to get that. You got that. It's your body. But you may not realize that. So here's the, that, that, all this has been theory. Let me give you practice. It's two parts to it. We'll do the first part uh, in pairs, and then I'll explain the second part to you. You need a partner for this, this little exercise. We're going to awaken the bodies, our bodies, to their divine name. That is them. So you need a partner. And ideally, though, you make the call yourself. If you want to work with someone, and you want to touch the other person, you're going to draw the name of God on the other person's body with your finger, and so you want to make physical contact. If that doesn't work for you or the person you're working with, then you just do it in front of them. You follow that? So don't feel like you have to be touched. If you don't want to be touched, don't be touched. You just don't. So what I need you to do is to find someone to do the exercise with. Mm -hmm. and actually, looking at me is not going to help. You need a partner. <laughs> find, find a quick, quickly find someone to, to do this with. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right, so do we have, everybody got someone to work with? Yeah, we do. Uh, <laughs> so the next part of this is, you have to decide which one of you is person A and which one of you is person B. That's the hardest part. Uh, uh, All right? We got that A and B. So now I have, so I can say person A to this, person B. Okay, so if you can stand, put all your stuff down. Stand and face your partner. Okay, anybody that wants to do this without a partner? You got no partner or are you passing them? You're fine. Okay. okay, so you can just imagine this moment. Okay, so person A will receive. So person B will draw. So person A, what I want you to do is just stand comfortably with your hands at your sides and just relax. <laughs> yeah, no cheek pulling. I'm going to walk you through this. So person A is standing with her or his hands at your side, just relaxed, 
take a couple of deep breaths just to center in. And then I'm going to guide person B in drawing on person A. You're just going to use your pointer finger, whatever right hand up. So the first letter of God's name is like the number seven. It's going to start at the forehead. It's going to go across the forehead. And then back down, just like you're writing the number seven on a piece of paper. Across the forehead, then down the bridge of the nose, tip of the nose, over the lips to the chin. Which side of the forehead? <laughs> Which side? Am <laughs> I doing it to Hebrew eyes? No, 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 like, like a seven. Like that. Like, like, what you said over the bridge of the nose. But it's not like yeah. 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 So across the forehead, yeah. it's like a seven. <laughs> You're all orthodox or rhythmic. <laughs> so across the forehead, then down over the nose, tip of the nose, down to the chin, like that. That's how I make my sevens with a curve. <laughs> so person B is uh, uh, drawing person A, um, right? Yeah. Person A is receiving. So person A, just feel that letter. Not simply on your face, but as your head. Your whole, this is just trying to wake you up. So your entire head is the first letter of God's name. That's what we're trying to imagine here. So an exercise in, in imagination. The second letter of God's name, you're going to put two fingers at the center of the chest, the sternum. And then you're going to go across to the shoulders. You'll separate your fingers out across to the shoulders. And then down the arms. Down the arms? Yeah. So there's technically a space, but we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> okay, so this is the second letter of God's name. Just stand with that for a second. The two letters together, the yud that's your head, and the hey that is now your shoulders and arms, that's actually the name of God in and of itself, Yah. So when we say hallelujah, hallelujah is praise, Yah is one of the divine names. So the awareness of your very being as the divine begins to emerge with the second letter. Third letter, one finger at the sternum, you go straight down the torso, belly button to the waist. This is a straight line. Of course, on me it's a curved line. It's a curved line. So that's the third letter of God's name. The last letter, if you can do this, is two fingers at the center of the waist. And you go up to the side, you know, separate your fingers, you go out to the side of the hips, and then if you can do it, down to the floor. But some of us can't. Some of us are just. So then just stand there, both of you will stand there, but the person who received, just try to remember what was happening here. So your head is the yud. Your uh, shoulders, your arms is the head, your torso is the vav, the third letter. And then your waist, your pelvis, all that, down to your feet, your legs, that's the fourth letter. Your very body is the name of God. We're just trying to wake it up. Your very body is the name of God. So we'll switch you know, receiver and, and drawer. So if you were just receiving, then you've been opening your eyes. If you were just drawing, then close your eyes, stand with your hands at your side. Take up a moment to just uh, <laughs> settle into that posture. Standing pose. And now, we're going to draw on the other person. So the letter Yud is the seven with a bend, if you like. So you're going to go across the forehead like you would with a seven and then back down the bridge of the nose, tip of the nose, lips, to the chin. Your head is the first letter of God's name, the good Y. Then two fingers at the sternum and then across the shoulders and down to the fingers, all the way down the arms to the fingers. Second letter of God's name, the word Yah. So just be with that for a second. And try to imagine, like in the Michelangelo, when you know he says that he's not carving something into the stone, he's removing the parts of the stone that reveal the carving. So we're just sort of awakening the body to what it already is. The emerging divine consciousness. Not in the body, 
but as the body itself, in, with, and at. Then the third letter starts at the sternum, just one finger, and then straight down to the belly button of the waist. So your whole torso is remembering its divine nature. And then two fingers at the center of the waist, you separate them out to the sides of the legs, and then you go down to the floor if you can do it. And then just stand with that. You can both stand and reclaim. Of the letters? Yeah. Yeah, so the first letter is Yud, the second letter is He, the third letter is Avav, and the fourth letter is a He, two He's. Okay, so then you can sit with that for a second. Yeah. Mm. So that's part of the exercise. So you are the divine manifest. <coughs> So what? <laughs> All right, the, the first thing is this is hard to remember. So that's why we, we do the physical part, try to wake the body up. Whatever your shape, whatever condition your body is in, it's all in the name, it, it, it's all, a, each one is a variant of the single name of God. Unpronounceable, which means unconditioned and unconditionable. We're, we're making that journey to lech lecha, to your truest self. And we're starting with the body. So Judaism has this tradition to help you remember, because you're going to forget. And the tradition says, and you can take this literally or not, I tend to take it more metaphorically, but tradition says that each one of us has an angel assigned to us. It's not a guardian angel, right? Because if it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's God. It's all God. So the angel doesn't protect you from anything. <clears throat> it's not the, um, I can't remember which company it was, the, the credit card angel that keeps you from using the wrong credit card so you get the best, the best rate, right? It's not that angel either. This angel has only one job. This angel walks with you wherever you go, but walks in front of you and has only one assignment. And the assignment is to call out to anyone, as Jesus might say, with the ears to hear, behold, here comes the image of God. In Genesis 1.26, God says, let us, whatever that means. We can assume it's, you know, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva or something. I don't know if you want to understand the plural there. But God says, let us make the human being in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1.26. The next verse, when it's actually done, it says, uh, and God made the human in God's image. Doesn't mention likeness. So when the rabbis see something like that, you could say, oh, they forgot it. It's a typo. Or you could say, no, these are hints built into the Bible to help us using our imagination, to help us reclaim spiritual teachings by engaging with the text. So why does it say the intent of God is to create us in God's image and likeness, but the actuality is image only? And their answer is that each of us is a manifestation of the image of God, but the likeness is an act of intention. You have to act on that, which back to what we were talking about earlier, means you have to work in the, with the current, with the divine current. But that's something you've got to choose to do. So you're in the image of God, whether you are the likeness of God, whether you act in a godly manner, that is a choice that you make. And by godly manner, I'm meaning, because it's all God, but working with that current toward um, being a blessing to all the families of the earth. So that's up to you. This is the part where we get to that. So you are the image of God. We try to wake ourselves up to that. This angel is saying, behold, here comes the image. Uh, it actually says, here comes the image and likeness of God. The angel is reminding us that we now have to act in a certain way. When we hear our angels, there's supposed to be a trigger that says, oh, that's right. I'm the image of God. Let me act as the likeness of God. 
I am God, let me act godly. So the angel is trying to remind you, because you hear your angel, if you do, and that's the practice, and anyone else with the ears to hear can hear it as well. Now, I don't know about other people, so I'm not going to worry about them. You can only worry about yourself. So the challenge of the practice is threefold. Here's the first two. The first one is whenever you see a reflection of yourself in the glass, in the mirror, don't do what I do and go, oh my god, you have to lose weight. Right? That's, <laughs> that's usually what I do. You look at the reflection and you say, oh, behold, the image of God. Whether I'm in a wheelchair or I'm on a crutch or I'm, you know, whatever my situation is, it's always the image of God. Can I see myself that way? So I told you I like to work with kids. I had a bunch of high school students and we were doing this exercise and I asked them, I said, how do you walk from class to class in high school? And you know, they have these heavy backpacks and, and they're, they're miming it you know, for me and they're walking like this. And I said, okay, if you knew you were the image of God, how would you walk? Now, there's always one or two boys who go, make way, image of God, coming through. <laughs> there's always a couple of kids like that. But everyone else just went from going to class to just a natural sort of royal stance, relaxed. And they just did it. All about the They just knew that if they were the image of the divine, they wouldn't walk like this. And they wouldn't walk like this. They would walk like this gracefully engage in life as they went through. So when you see your image, the first thing is to say, ah, that's right, I am the image of God. Then you hear your angel reminding you over and over again, behold, here comes the image and likeness if you choose to act on it. So those are the first two things. The third part of it is you have to remember that everyone else has her or his angel also. So when you're meeting someone else, whether it's here or you're on the street and you, know, you see someone who's begging on the street, listen for their angel. Like Mother Teresa seeing everyone as, as Christ. Listen for their angel and say, as their angel comes close to you, saying, behold, this person sitting on the ground begging is the image and likeness of God. Can you, as your angel reminds you, can you meet? You know, namaste, I, I bow to the divine, I, it's usually translated within you, but I, I, I prefer to say I bow to the divine that is you. So can you experience that with the other person and engage that person in a holy manner, whatever that may be? I, I, you can't judge that in advance. You're stepping into that unconditioned place where you're a blessing to the other, but if you know what being a blessing is in advance of that meeting, then you're just following a script. It's not unconditioned. But if it's the divine, meeting the divine, what happens will happen. What, what, what does happen will be the right thing to happen. So you've got to awaken to your own divinity. You have to awaken to the challenge to be the likeness of God, not just the image of God. And then listen for everyone else in the same way. So when you, you see people you don't like, you go, oh, here comes the image of God. What a jerk. <laughs> you know? Because if it's good, it's God. If it's not good, it's also God. I'm not saying that the person isn't a jerk. It's just God manifesting as jerk. <laughs> Can I treat that jerk with respect? Not changing anything, but engaging it all with a sense of, of holiness and grace. That's what moving toward uh, a Jewish Vedanta or invited Judaism is about. It's having a theology of non-duality and then living it out in practicality. You can go through, and I'm just about done because we're going to go to lunch. Um, you can go through the, I would argue, you can go through the entirety of Jewish tradition, 613 commandments, and interpret them all in a way to fit what I'm saying. The way you treat the bread, the way you treat the, the, the animals in your life, the way you treat nature, all of the rules that we have in Judaism can all be read as a way of A, remembering who you are, B, remembering who the other is, animate, inanimate, sentient or not, and then acting in that godly way, aligning yourself with the divine, stepping out of your conditioning, the lech lecha, stepping into the place, which is the place you happen to be, with your eyes wide open, without the conditioning, and then engaging that moment and that being 
so as to be a blessing to it, to him, her, it, them, you know, whatever it is, to be a blessing to that, that being. That to me is, is part of what an, an Advaita or a Vedanta Judaism would, would be like. So I'm going to stop with that. Just going to give you a heads up. For those of you who cannot stay, come back to the second talk this afternoon, just so you feel totally guilty about it, because you're really going to miss out. The next part is going to be on the Divine Mother. And how we, you know, we've been talking here about the unmanifest, becoming manifest. Now we're going to talk about the, the manifest um, aspect of God, which is the, you know, the Shakti element, which is, in, in this case, we're going to talk about Chochmah and Shekhinah and, and all kinds of Jewish understandings of this, and how the return of the Divine Mother as a more conscious element within Judaism is part of the turning of Judaism toward a Vedanta understanding. So thank you very much for your, your attention for this. So that we don't actually have Q&A until, I, I didn't realize that, until 4.30. So if you had a question, eat it. But we have 15 minutes till, till lunch, Do we, and there's nothing down here. So can I take, can we take questions, is that all right? Okay, then. Of the letters? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yud, hey, vav, hey. Yud is that seven. Hey is the cross with the two legs. Vav is the straight line. And the hey is, again, the, the top of the two legs. Is the cross the length of the left side? No, there's supposed to be a space. But I never draw it that way on bodies because then it gets confusing. So you, well, Yahweh, if you're, yeah, at the university we used to say Yahweh. <laughs> but, that is what I also heard, Yahweh. Yeah, that's what we said. But that's not, we don't really know how to pronounce it. Yeah. I have an obvious question that I'm sure you get a lot. So in your um, philosophy of uh, radical non-dualism, how do you um, fit in radical Yeah, I think that God, I, mean, I don't know if everyone heard the question, but the question was, what do you do with evil? What do you do with something like the Holocaust? What do you do with you know, the, the Rwandan genocide? What do you do with, uh, um, uh, what's his name, Assad in, in Syria, and, and you know, all, all the evil in the world? So the only way I can understand it from this perspective, and again, it's just another conditioned perspective, is that it's all God. The question is, are these individuals, is Hitler, I have no problem saying Hitler is a manifestation of God. I have a problem saying who acted godly. <laughs> That's the current part. He's swimming against the current. He did not see himself, or maybe if he did, he, only, he saw only himself as a manifestation of God. He did not see the other as an equal manifestation of God. So, the, the, so, so to me, it's, it's like when I quickly went over that, the notion of the ocean and parts of the ocean are in turmoil and parts of the ocean are calm. So the infinite manifestation of God includes all this negative stuff. It's just part of the potentiality of the, of, of the divine. Whether you and I turn it into an actuality, that's something else. Evil has, you know, the, the tsunami that killed quarter of a million uh, Indonesians, that's not evil, that's nature. And of course, if you're one of them, it's evil. <laughs> It, it feels horrible, but it's not like someone did that to them. Uh, let, let me give you a better example, smaller example. <clears throat> Certainly nothing equating to the Holocaust, but in 1992 in Miami, we had Hurricane Andrew, which was at that time the worst storm ever to hit the United States. I lived through that. My neighborhood was devastated. That's not evil. That's just nature. And things like that have to happen. Hurricanes are part of the natural balance. After that, Many of us were living in the rubble of our neighborhoods, trying to rebuild and, and taking care of one another. And there was a spontaneous outpouring of compassion for, for one another. We helped each other, even if you didn't know your neighbors, we all helped each other. Then the looting started. People from outside the area started coming in. And then the, the first one that, that came, the first, the first uh, business people that came in were selling ice. We were, this is Miami in August, and we had no power for weeks. And so people were coming in selling us bags of ice, bags of ice that would cost 49 cents in the supermarket, but the supermarkets are shut. They were charging $20 a bag. That's evil. The hurricane, not. People exploiting one another, that's evil. So, but it's simply 
a manifestation of God, ignorant of who they truly are, ignorant of who the, the rest of us are, and I would include nature in that as well, acting out of ignorance rather than out of awareness. So you, the, the possibility for the Holocaust always exists. It's just a question of uh, do people manifest it or not. But I, I don't, you know, I, I see God as impersonal fundamentally. So, so in this aspect, we'll get to the other later. So I don't think God plans it, but the possibility always, always exists. Do you want to say anything else about it before we? You have, yes. If, uh, yeah, uh, that's very great question. So even speaking with the current, against the current, there's always a duality. Uh, my understanding of non-dual is not to erase opposites. It's to see the opposites in a greater non-duality. So uh, it's not the same. If I come over and <clears throat> I, I give you a, a, you know, a hug, that's not the same as if I come over and hit you over the head with a club. Both of them are possible. Both of them are, man are, are potential manifestations of the singular reality in which you and I exist. But the differences are still present. I don't, I don't want to do away with good and bad. I just want to do away with the notion that there's bad over here and good over here and they're not connected. I think it's positive and negative in a single magnet. They go together, good and bad, like front and back, up and down, in and out. So I don't, that, that to me is what non-duality is, is the recognition of the greater non-duality, but not at the expense of good and bad up and down. You know, you know what I mean? We, those concepts still work, but they cannot be separated from one another. They have to be seen as an integrated whole. So evil is still, a, is real. I don't, I don't take the notion that evil is an illusion. Evil is real. It's just not other than the divine. It's just another manifestation. Money and mass society, from my point of view, is evil. The entirety of the scheme, which has people at different levels, some working more or less as slaves, I think is entirely evil. However, in my mind, my personal theology, it feels like there could be a mass awakening where there's an energetic shift to divinity out of time to a higher energetic state where things would make a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, That's mine. I, I, I mean, what I heard... Well, you know, what, one of the things that makes the Holocaust work, that um, makes, you know, Hutus go after Tutsis and vice versa, is the demonization of the other. That you say, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. So I'm holy and they're not holy. I'm saved, they're damned. I'm the true believer, they're, you know, every religion has that dichotomy built into it. That's the lowest level of, of religiosity, I would say. So. Um, I, I hope, you know, I want to agree <laughs> that we are on the verge of an awakening. Good. Yeah, and that the awakening is going to be, to one degree or another, that, you know, Teresa is a manifestation of God. I want to know that. Not, not intellectually, because I read it, you know, in this book, but because I see God, I see her as God. And then I can't exploit her. Then I can't make her work for less than a living wage. Then I can't, it's not, I don't, I'm not saying I'm against laws, because I'm, I'm not an anarchist, but uh, I am saying that I will naturally, if I understand who you really are, I will naturally treat you in, in, the, in, a, in the right way. You know, I, my dog, I, I can tolerate people, I love dogs. So I don't think it's an accident that, you know, dog is God spelled backwards. I think dogs are divine. Cats, cats are just tax spelled backwards. It doesn't even mean anything. <laughs> But dogs, dogs to me are holy. So my, I have a, um, you know, you can come and look at my phone. It's on my screen saver here. My, my dog is a golden retriever. She is a rescue dog. Somebody took these little puppies, bred them to torture them. And 
I don't get how you can do that. I don't get how you can do that to a dog or a cat or a horse or any animal. Certainly, I don't get how you can do it to a human. But it seems to me the only way you can do that is to see that other as an it, as a, as a non-entity, not as a divine manifestation. So, so I, I, I hope you're right. I, I want to think that today. <laughs> yeah. So if, uh, if we're all awakened, if we're all, if, if, if we're all with the current, does that mean there would be no evil? No, there, there would be no evil manifest. If, you know, I'm taking you literally, we're all awakened. Yeah, we, we couldn't, the potential would be there somewhere, you know, but the conditions, the conditions wouldn't allow it. Because I... Is that, is that what it's ultimately, what God is? Uh, the potential, but not... Yeah, the well... Evil because I hear in the Bible, God is love. God is love. Again and again and again. How do you square that? I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you can say God is X. Because then, unless you're going to say God is A through Z, then that's different. So God is X and Y and all that. But I, I don't say God is love. I say God is reality. Reality includes the possibility of love and includes the possibility of hate. So, so the question is, who's manifesting? So if all of us were in that state of divine awakening, you know, I, I, I never, it never occurs to me. Now, it does occur to other people, and this is a, what we call a disease. But it never occurs to me to take my right hand, to get an ax in my right hand and cut off my left. Now, that guy who did it because his hand was strapped and he was dying, that's different. But I don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I really feel like doing that. But I better not because there's a law against it. I don't, I don't say that. It never occurs to me till, till just now. And I'm still not going to do it. <laughs> And the reason is, because this is me. Why would I hack myself to pieces? Now again, there's people who cut and all that stuff. I'm not talking about them. That's different. But <clears throat> they're having, you know, something else is going on. But someone within that normal spectrum doesn't normally think to do that. Why? Because I recognize that's me. It's a bad idea. When we awake to this realization, I know that you're that too. You know, when it says in Leviticus, Love your neighbor as yourself. When I teach it in the, in, in the university, I don't know if you run into this, my students always quote it wrong, and they go, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it doesn't say that. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because there's just one self. I think we're talking capital S, Ottman. I, I'll tell you a real quick story. <clears throat> I was lecturing in Huntsville, Alabama, you know, with the accents and the southern accent. I'm from Massachusetts, and I kept talking about the big S self. And I was saying, God is the big S. And there's a reporter in the room who only heard big ass. <laughs> and she kept saying, God is a big ass. But I kept hearing, God is the big S. So I would say, yes, that's correct. The next day in the newspaper, Rabbi says, God is a big ass. <laughs> and I had to call the paper. And I said, let me spell it for you with a capital S. And the lady called me back. She was so embarrassed. Right, so they fixed it. The correction. Rabbi did not say God is a big ass. But God is a big ass also if God is everything. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, but it's when we don't recognize one another as the singular self that we have all of these, all of these problems. I mean, yeah. So let I me mean, leave it at that. You read some quotes from some leaders of the Chabad movement would say that everyone and everything is God. Now, I went to the Chabad when <laughs> I was exploring different r religious yeah. organizations, and they didn't seem to respect you. <laughs> yeah. They didn't follow their right. rituals exactly. It's like, why, why is that? Yeah, it's for the same reason that you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote, you know, all men are created equal, and what he meant were white men you know, that, that, that own property. It's, it's, we say these things that have these great potential as they evolve, but we don't necessarily understand what we've said. Yeah, th there's a great difference. I mean, I mean look, I, I quoted from um, Schnur Zalman of Liadi in the 1700s, <clears throat> one of those texts, the guy who founded Chabad. This stuff is found in a book called Tanya, which I've translated. 
And I went to my Rebbe, Zalman Shachter Shalomi, and I said, I want to translate Tanya. And he says, why? And I said, because I always recommend the book to people. And they come back and say, this is the most evil book I've ever read. It hates women. It hates non-Jews. And, and I, I said, I, I don't get it. And he says, well, what parts have you read? And I've only read these little sections that I like, and I skip the rest. And he says, so what are you going to do with all those bad sections? I said, no, I'm not going to translate those. This is the best of, you know? So he said, yeah, do that. So you get these individuals who were, who were capable periodically <coughs> of having that lech lecha experience, dropping their conditioning and saying these amazing things and then falling right back into that conditioning and saying, oh, women, pff, they're no good. They don't have, you know, non-Jews don't have souls and women are evil. And, and it's like, what happened to them? Well, they're human. So, so and they're not... They, they glimpsed something, but they couldn't stick with it. They couldn't carry it to the nth degree. We're all in that, in that situation. So, I mean, that's how you get people who are, in some cases, so holy. I mean, you know, I, I've had Zen masters and, and different gurus who, who are so brilliant in one area of their life, but in their relationship with their students, they were horrible. They, they were abusive and exploitative. I mean, I, I have one teacher who was an alcoholic, uh, who, which is something you wrestle with, but then who did horrible things when he was drunk and excused it all as being, no, it's, it's just part of my teaching. Um, so so you, you have to make a distinction between the teaching when it's right and the teachers who are oftentimes wrong, not living up to their own teaching. So, I mean, I'm not an Orthodox Jew. I tried being a Chabad once. You know, I, I moved into their, their village in... Israel and lasted 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> I said, no, this is definitely, definitely not for me. I've, we're almost out of time, but go ahead. Uh, so you said you learned all this wisdom at a later stage privately from the rabbis. Is it because uh, that they don't want to talk about it or they don't see it that way? This is what I was told. When, when I was at... Um, in seminary, learning to become, you know, studying to become a rabbi. There was one, there, there were three rabbis, one, two rabbis and a, and a lay professor who were into all of this. And they never taught a class in it. They would teach you privately, but there, and I would say, why aren't we all learning this? And their response to me, and all three of them would say this, their response to me was, nobody would get it. You know, they, they're not, that's not what they're interested in. That's not where they're at. They, they want to know X about you know, how to do a wedding or they want to know, you know how to do a funeral. And, and the practical, what they used to call, they said, think of seminary as going to dentistry school. <laughs> you don't need to have a theory <clears throat> of teeth. You need to know how to drill them and you know, do that. So that, they, they had, now I felt that they were dumbing the students down, but that, that was their thing. But maybe not. Maybe, maybe this is just for people who are interested. I, I have no idea. But they, don't, they didn't teach it openly. Um, someone like you know, Zalman Shachter Shalomi, who's my teacher, he teaches, you know, not, now he's elderly. He's not doing this so much. But he, he teaches it openly. But um, I had to find teachers who, in Israel and elsewhere, who were just on the fringes of the society teaching this radical stuff. Uh, so I don't, you know, I, w I wish it were more open. I think I think Jewish people would be more inclined to stick around with Judaism if this uh, this stuff was was out there. Ramdas and I, you know, Ramdas. Yeah. So Ramdas and I were in New York once, teaching together, and um, he came on stage after it wasn't me. Someone else was talking about Jewish meditation and the same stuff, and he said, you know, if I had known this was in Judaism, I never would have gone to India. I could have learned this here. But, you know, he didn't learn it. I, one other thing, one, there was a rabbi back in the 60s. Um, he was from here, not from here, from Massachusetts. Um, I don't know, it was maybe Worcester or something around there. And he wrote a book called Nine and a Half Mystics. It was about Jewish mysticism. And I went to one of his workshops at Boston University, and it was amazing. And I went up to him afterwards, and I said, Rabbi, where do you do this in your synagogue? I want to go to your synagogue. And he laughed. And he said, are you kidding? I could never do this in my synagogue. They'd fire me. <laughs> so 
sometimes it's the seminary, sometimes it's the synagogue world. They're not ready for it. They don't want to hear this. So, you know, you never know. It's, it's sort of sad. Anyway, I am over time, and I know we have lunch. So, again, thank you very much. Hopefully to see most of you, if not all of you, later.